Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us after uh, what's been a pretty difficult week for all of us, I'm sure. And it's uh, a pleasure to welcome you here this morning. My hope is, as we go through this morning, that we might uh, find uh, comfort and uh, protection in God's presence here. I want to uh, say thank you, first of all, to everybody who supported us uh, as we were on the mission trip. Um, really, really grateful to this congregation for giving both the youth and the adults the opportunity to go uh, to Roanoke and serve. We just got back a couple days ago, and uh, so I'm still uh, recovering a little bit from that. Uh, so if I don't make a lot of sense, that's the reason why. Um, but I want to thank you all for just your tremendous support and for your prayers. We had a great trip, and you'll hear more about that as the time goes on. I want to thank especially our adult leaders who uh, journeyed with us there. That was a, a quite a commitment, quite a sacrifice that people have made. A uh, couple of announcements here as we get started. First of all, I want to say uh, a word to our visitors. If you're visiting with us today, well, thank you so much for being here today. I hope that each one of you will take a minute. There's a red attendance pad that's on the inside of the pew that you'll pass it down. It's one of the ways that we get to know one another's names. And so if, you're, if you are visiting today, if you'd be willing to share with us your name and address information, that would be a great thing. Uh, there's a little space for that at the bottom of the page, and we'd appreciate that. Uh, I want to lift up a couple of opportunities to serve today. And the first one is that uh, next Sunday, we're going to start uh, our process of getting ready for Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School is a really big uh, thing for us here at this church. And uh, we're going to start to decorate the whole church uh, beginning next Sunday after this service, after the 1030 service. So if you'd like to be part of that, just point, make a plan to stick around next Sunday, uh, July 17th, after 1030. We'll get started with that. We have some other opportunities to serve that include the Interfaith Hospitality Network. We're going to need a lot of help with that. And especially during these summer months, it's hard to get volunteers. So if there's any way that you can help, you can find all the different positions that are available. They're right um, to the left of the door as you go out, and you can find out uh, different ways that you can be in service. We also have the Feed My Sheep ministry that's coming up soon. So you can check out those opportunities. You'll find them in the bulletin. And then uh, I want to lift up an opportunity for all of you to celebrate with Kathleen and I. Um, this, uh, in this congregation, we have a tradition of celebrating the appointment of, reappointment of our pastors each year, which I appreciate because I like cake, and there's always cake involved. And so we invite you to come and join us uh, up in the Fellowship Hall uh, for some cake after worship today. I think those are all the announcements that I have for right now. Kathleen? And there's gluten-free. There is. There's gluten-free gluten -free cake, cake for Kathleen. <laughs> and for anyone else that needs gluten-free. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good morning. We invite you to stand as you're able and join in the call to worship. Freedom is coming. We can hear it in the voices of the oppressed. Hope is coming. We can see it in the eyes of all those who despair. God is here. We count, we count on, on God's, God's presence, presence with us to guide us, guide us heal, heal, and uplift lift our, our spirits. spirits. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. And I invite you to join me in our opening prayer. Lord God Almighty, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. For freedom, Christ has made you free. Do not submit to the yoke of sins, sin's slavery. Praise, Praise be, be to God, God for the, the incredible God gift of his grace and forgiveness. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's take a moment to greet those around us with the peace of Christ. I'd like to invite our children to come forward for some time together. I see you all the way in the back. Come on. <laughs> come, oh, there you go. OK, you can do it. You can do it. I know it's a long walk. <laughs> Thank you for coming up. How are you? All right. <laughs> OK. Well, I wanted to talk to you about rules, because there seem to be a lot of rules. Don't you think there's a lot of rules? Too many rules, right? Yeah. So if you play any sports, do you have rules in sports? Yeah. Yes? No tackling. Okay, no tackling. We don't want to tackle. No, that's not a good thing. And when you're in school, are there rules? And at home, are there rules? Yes. You know, there's just <laughs> rules, rules, rules all the time. Why do you think we have rules? To keep us safe. To keep us safe. Very good. Exactly. It keeps us safe, and it helps us also to work together. Because if we didn't have rules, then we'd all do whatever we wanted, and it would, we'd never get along. We might never get along. We'd just always be in it for ourselves and not caring about one another. I read something this week that said that one of the things that scientists have discovered about human beings is that since the beginning of there being human beings like us, those people, for some reason, have always known they needed to get along with each other. And that's how we have survived as people, because we've learned how to get along with each other. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way, right? Sometimes it doesn't seem like we get along very well. But that's what the rules help us with. Now, think about if you cross the street. What are the rules for crossing the street? Look both ways. What other rules are there for crossing the street, Ethan? Where are you supposed to cross? Do you cross in the middle of the block? No, where do you cross? And the crosswalk, right. And if there's a traffic light, do you go when it's red or green? Yeah. Right, when the cars stop and it's green in the direction that you want to walk, right? You go just like a car goes when it's green. Car stops when it's red. People stop when it's red and yeah. So there's rules for crossing the street because if you didn't follow the rules, the chances are there might be an accident, right? <laughs> now, do you need those rules if there's only one car that goes down the road once an hour? Yes. You still need the rules, right? Because you never know what, when that one car is coming. You've yeah, got to look. Walk. Right. But it's even more important to have a traffic light if there's lots of cars, right? Yeah. So those are rules that help to keep us safe. 
And when we're small, we probably cross holding hands with an older person, right? With an adult or an older sibling or friend, right? So those are rules that keep us safe. And that's something that people have always had. Now in the Bible, it says that's called kind of the golden rule. Do you know what the golden rule is? What's the golden rule? Treat others how you want to be treated. And the golden rule, actually, that's something that we think was part of human beings' ability to get along with one another. It was part of society even before the Bible was written. Because every faith tradition and all cultures have something like that that says, do for others what you want them to do for you. So if it was just that easy, we can just remember that rule, all right? Help us to remember that rule. So let's pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks for the rules in our lives that keep us safe, and we especially give you thanks for the golden rule. Help us to remember to do for others as we'd like them to do for us. Amen. And thanks for coming up today. I want to say thank you, Carl. Carl and I had a funny conversation this week. Um, he came to me, it was like 1130. He's like, do you think it's a little too late to practice my trumpet? And I said, well, it, it might be tonight. Yes, thank you, Carl. That was wonderful. Uh, today's scripture is the New Testament, uh, the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, 
for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear for the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval. For it is God's servant for our good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid. For the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the servant of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be subject not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, busy with this very thing. Pay to all what is due them, taxes to whom taxes are due, Revenue to whom revenue is due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom respect is due. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to start a, a new series today, and the series, as you can see from the uh, bulletin, it's called Being Christian in an Election Year, and uh, it's a tough day to start this series, to be honest, uh, very difficult today, um, and what I'd like to do is do two weeks now, and then what I'd like to be able to do in the fall is maybe pick it up again and do another two weeks as we get a little closer to the election so uh, we'll see how that goes and see, uh, so far so good, let's put it that way. No, nobody called for tarring and feathering of the pastor after the first <laughs> service, so we're all right so far. Uh, but let's take a moment and let's pray together as we get started. God, we are grateful for your power at work in our lives. And we trust that your grace is at work even in a week like this. Lord, we pray uh, for the nation. We pray for each of us as individuals that together we might walk in the way that you are teaching us. Lord, we pray uh, for our faith to be made real and true in the world around us. And Lord, we pray that these words that I speak here this morning might be your words to your people. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. It is difficult, and I had a lot of trouble last night um, being able to figure out what it is I ought to say this morning. When I'm away, whether I'm on a mission trip or I'm on vacation, usually that's an opportunity for me to take a little break from the news. That's normally what I do, just because you know, I find that that's a good thing for me every once in a while. So I had not heard about Alton Sterling. I had not heard about Philando Castile. I had not heard about um, any of the events that led up to Dallas. But certainly when um, the shootings happened in Dallas, then I could not help but hear about those. I'd say first that police have an incredibly difficult job. They have perhaps the most difficult job that I can imagine to have to make split-second decisions when people's lives are on the line. Um, and I've seen this from a couple different angles. Um, and in particular, I think when it's really been driven home to me is when I've done some weddings for police officers and their wives. And uh, in the premarital counseling, we spent a lot of time talking about what that job does to the other uh, party in that marriage. And uh, I do not envy police. I do not envy them their jobs. 
And I know that the vast, vast majority of them, uh, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, are idealists who really believe in the idea that justice is for all and see themselves as being there to protect the community and not just certain members of the community, but all members of that community. And in fact, that's exactly what the police were there to do uh, during the rally and the march that was taking place in Dallas. They were there to protect the protesters, um, protecting their right to be heard even when they were protesting, in fact, against the police. So from the accounts that I've heard, um, and this has been true across different media outlets, uh, up to the point at which the shooting started, the police and the protesters had been getting along fine. There were a couple of incidents, but nothing real significant. In fact, um, some of the protesters paused along the route to take pictures with the officers, and there were some photos that were posted on social media of uh, smiling faces, people with uh, officers, and um, just enjoying being together in a moment of peace and clarity. And that's what makes what happened next that much more painful. I hope, too, that over the past few years, from um, Trayvon Martin up to now, that it's becoming clearer to those of us who are white that we have a different relationship to the police than do people of color. That's part of the privilege that we have as white Americans. We have a different relationship with the police. And if you have not yet begun to reflect on this in the wake of these shootings, in the wake of this violence, then I encourage you to start thinking about it. Start today. For any of us to say, you know what, this doesn't affect me, I'm colorblind, I don't see race. I don't believe it. I think it's a cheap way for us to say, I'm done working on this problem within myself. But all this work out of some assumptions about people. This is how we're wired, and there's no getting away from it. So we need to keep examining, we need to keep discussing, we need to keep dismantling these assumptions within ourselves if there is to be any real change. So now that I'm back, um, Kathleen and I have started to exchange some um, information about having some times of conversation around these issues. And we'll try to put those together and uh, figure out a plan for that. And I hope that you will come with us and participate in some of those conversations. And I also want to say this, and just to say this once and to leave it there. A society that's armed to the teeth is not safer. It's just more on edge all the time. Our fear is a wonderful thing for companies that make guns and ammunition, but I'm not sure it's so good for the rest of us. I wanted to do a series about being Christian in an election year because I feel very strongly that we've lost sight of something. We've lost sight of this fact, and I think this, the events of this week drive this home. We've lost sight of the fact that there is but one nation, one nation. When we pledge allegiance to the flag, right? We talk about one nation. Not two nations, not a red nation and a blue nation. We talk about one nation. And we've lost sight of this. What affects the black community affects me. What affects immigrants? It affects me. What affects religious minorities? It affects me. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You can't look at one thing and conclude that it's not part of this whole. It's my hope that we can come to realize and see how it is that all of these issues are connected and why they all matter. Because they're not someone else's concerns. 
They're not someone else's problems. They are our problems. Because there is only one nation. So I want to begin the series with this really basic kind of foundational question that I want us to give some consideration to. And there are a lot of ways to look at this. And it's hard in 15 minutes, 20 minutes to break this down. Because there's so much in the scripture, I think, that speaks to it. But as Christians, what is our relationship to the state? What should our relationship be? That's kind of the basic question. And what we read today is a really important text in those conversations. has been for centuries. This passage from Romans. It is one of the texts that I find to be among the most difficult in the Bible. It's one of the hardest ones for me to swallow. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists whom God has appointed. Think about that next time you complain about the president. And those who resist will incur judgment. Now, when you take this at face value, this passage is incredibly disturbing. Think of the extreme case. Think about Germany under Adolf Hitler. Are we to believe then that his authority was instituted by God? I really can't believe that. I hope that you can't believe it either. And in fact, when you read through the Bible, you find that the Bible is arguing with itself on this point. Because as you read through, especially the Hebrew scriptures that describe the reigns of the kings, what you find is that many of the kings of Israel are described as apostate and completely ungodly. So if you were to go to the writers of the Bible and say, was this person's uh, reign instituted by God? I think they would say, yeah, I don't think so. Because the way it's written, it reads, that's their impression. Now, if you took this passage literally, what would it say? Would we have celebrated Independence Day? Would have been impossible, right? We'd still all be subjects of the queen, right? We'd be speaking about her majesty and singing God save the queen instead of my country tis of thee. We would never consider a peaceful protest for the redress of grievances. What was happening in Dallas would be totally off the table. You might even question whether we ought to consider voting at all. If all the authorities that have been there have been instituted by God, then what's the point? Aren't we, by voting and trying to change outcomes, resisting God's will? Why should we bother? Now, fortunately, there are other passages in the Bible that also make a different argument. So, for example, in Acts 5, you have the disciples refusing to obey an order to stop preaching, and they say, we must obey God rather than any human authority. Remembering that the religious authorities and the secular authorities in Jerusalem were one, one and the same. You even find Jesus doing this. Kathleen reminded me of this during the first service. You know, when Jesus heals people on the Sabbath, is he not a lawbreaker? It was forbidden to heal people on the Sabbath. You could say he's resisting an authority that had been instituted by God. Now, fortunately, he's God, so he can do whatever he wants. But in that context, he was breaking the rules. Jesus, uh, for his part, he talks about these acts of resistance. And there's one that you might recognize in uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus said, if someone go forces you to go one mile, go the second mile with them as well. And so what this is a reference to is uh, the Roman army, when it passed through your town, they could conscript you for short-term service. They could say to you, carry my bag. And so you would have to go and you would have to carry their gear for a mile. That was the limit. But Jesus says, well, 
If they want to force you to carry their bag for a mile, you know what? Tell them you'll do it for two. In other words, show them the injustice of what they're doing by taking it even farther than what they're asking. In Roman times, Christians were well known and often criticized for their unwillingness to participate in all kinds of civic activities. They would not serve in the army. They would not hold any public offices throughout the empire. They were unwilling to participate in any of the activities that were generally thought of as being consonant with good citizenship in the Roman Empire. They were actually seen as antisocial. That was one of the charges that was leveled against them during persecutions. That these were antisocial people who cared nothing for the empire. But in reality, the single commitment that Christians were willing to make was to pray for those in authority, for leaders. You find that instruction in 1 Timothy. So the upshot of all this is option one for Christians in terms of their relationship with the state is to essentially ignore it. That's one option. To accept what it requires of us, to fulfill our obligations, but to do nothing more. Instead, to put our focus on that which is firmly in the spiritual realm and to see the secular, the political, and the spiritual as two very separate things. And there are obviously still Christian schools of thought that tend in that direction. So the Amish still exist among us, right? So I grew up in Pennsylvania, and we have Amish and Mennonite communities who generally follow these, this kind of separatist idea. And Jesus, too, can be quoted when you think about following that path. When he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, render unto God that which is God's, you separate those two things completely. You can also think about all the little groups throughout history who have formed communes and held everything in common in order to fill what we see in Acts chapter 2, the early church do it. So if you can believe it, there have also been strong tendencies towards what we might call today in modern terms, uh, the left of the political spectrum, where Christians set up essentially these communes that were, you know, what we associate with life in the 60s, right, in certain places. So throughout history, we've seen these separatist movements, and we've seen them play out in different ways. And there have been, of course, instances of the other end of the spectrum, where you have the state completely aligned with the church. You can think about Henry VIII, for example, taking control of the Church of England, taking it away from Rome, and saying, no, I will be the head of my own church in my own country. Now that's great, except when the power of the state is completely aligned with the church, it's not good either for the spiritual vitality of the church, because pastors become political appointees, right? But it's also terrible for religious minorities. So what do you end up with? Over time, you end up with the Pilgrims and the Mayflower and the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. We live in a country that our ancestors could not ever have imagined where every single adult, at least in theory, and we can talk about whether or not this is true actually in practice, but the idea that every single adult, in theory, is a political agent. Even the fact that we have the opportunity to consider the implications of our faith in terms of how they play out politically is itself a luxury that those who came in generations before us never ever could have imagined. Just could not even picture it. What do you mean? You have choices? Really? Even if you don't like the choices, you have choices. Up until very recently, you had to have three things going for you if you wanted to have any say in the way the community was run. You had to be white. You had to own property, right? 
It needed to be male. Those three things all had to apply in order for you to have any political say. So we have this great gift, but the question is, how will we use it? This is kind of where I want to end, is how do we use this opportunity? How should we use this opportunity? So during the campaign, Ted Cruz caused a little bit of a, 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 little bit of a stir, because one of the things that he said in an event in New Hampshire was this, I'm a Christian first, an American second. Now, he took a lot of flack for this. A lot. And people pointed out, and I perhaps rightly so, that if any adherent of any other religion who were running for president, say a Muslim running for president, had made the same statement, they would almost immediately be disqualified by the majority of the American people, which is probably true. But at the same time, is not our faith supposed to be the number one thing in our lives? Number one, what is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And in fact, the very first statement that we find in our United Methodist Social Principles is this one. It's in the section about politics and the political community. Our allegiance to God takes precedence over our allegiance to any state. That's exactly what Ted Cruz was saying in that moment. I am a Christian first and an American second. So that said, if your faith does not inform your vote, I think you're doing it wrong. If your faith does not inform your vote, you're doing it wrong. If you cannot articulate how it is that your faith shapes your belief about certain issues, your choice of party, your choice of candidate, then I challenge you to do some reflection about that in the months between now and November. Do some studying about how Christians have dealt with these issues in the past. And you can make a list of issues, ones that are important to you, war and peace, immigration, guns, welfare policy, tax policy. Make a list. Then read. Read the scriptures. Read what Christian thinkers have said about these things through time. Read our social principles. If you need resources, Kathleen or I can help you with those. And then discuss. You need to talk with people who are likely to agree with you. You also need to talk with people who are likely to disagree with you. Listen and learn. Now here's the problem. Our two-party system doesn't allow us a lot of choices. So as you go through and you make your list of issues A, B, C, D, E, F, right? You might find that, well, my views, having studied them, are more closely aligned with A, B, and C that this party holds. But on D, E, and F, I'm a little closer to this party. Now what do you do? Well, now you have a determination to make. What's the most important thing? A, B, C, or D, E, and F? Plus there's that pesky little thing that is the character of the candidate, right? Which is also vitally important for us to consider. So it's entirely possible for you and I to look at our options, to consider them in the light of our faith, and still have our votes cancel each other out. It's entirely possible. Even though no, we've both done the studying, even though we've both followed our Christian conscience, it's entirely possible that my vote will cancel yours out. Let me give you a sense of how this works. Both George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton both affiliate with the United Methodist Church. People come to a wide range of conclusions after studying these issues. So to be guided by faith does not always mean that we'll have exactly the same outcome. And that's okay. But what's not okay is for us to pretend that our faith and our vote have nothing to do with each other. That's not okay. 
What's not okay is for us to put our party identity or even our national identity above our identity as a follower of Jesus Christ. That's not okay. So this is the beginning of how to be a Christian in an election year. Amen? be seated. As we prepare to receive an offering, uh, so you'll see an announcement in the bulletin today. Uh, one of the things that we, uh, some of the conversations that we had when we were in Roanoke was with, um, I met some people who had just recently come back from uh, some mission work in West Virginia. And uh, as you know, there's been tremendous flooding in West Virginia over the past uh, several weeks. And this uh, event has really been like their Hurricane Sandy, uh, so much devastation uh, throughout the state. And so what our bishop has called on all of the United Methodist Churches in New Jersey to do is to take up an offering uh, to support our brothers and sisters in West Virginia. Now, one of the reasons why um, this is important in particular for our bishop is because he remembers that uh, when we were hit with Sandy, one of the first annual conferences to respond was the West Virginia Conference. And so I encourage you to give generously. I think that there are some uh, blue envelopes in your bulletin. If you'd like to write a check, um, you can just write WV in the memo line. 
And if you'd like to make a, a gift and put it in one of the blue envelopes, just mark the outside with WV. We'll make sure that it gets to the right place. I thank you in advance for your generosity. You don't need to be, uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time, uh, you don't need to feel obligated to put anything in the plate. We are happy to have you here. Look forward to seeing you again. Let's continue now by offering God our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. Pray with me. Loving God, we present now what we have brought to you, things that are both visible and invisible. The coins and paper represent our work and express in a clear and visible way our love and thanks. But we also bring as an offering the fragile dreams and hopes that we have. These invisible gifts are what sustains our lives. Receive all that we have brought in love, O oh God. Amen. You may be seated.
have just uh, one uh, prayer request this morning uh, that was given to me. And prayers for Andy today, um, that he might find forgiveness and that he might uh, be free from his anger and see some reconciliation in the lives of uh, his family. I also want to lift up a prayer uh, that came to me uh, this week while we were on the mission trip. I got an email from um, Pete Larson. Pete and Jeannie uh, worshiped with us along with their, their family, uh, Lindsay and Matt. Uh, they were part of this congregation for several years while they were stationed at uh, the base. And then uh, they moved on to, to a posting at the Pentagon. And uh, I got an email um, saying that Lindsay had had some pretty significant spinal surgery this week. Uh, so we want to be in prayer for Lindsay and uh, for the rest of that family as well. So let's take some time now and let's offer to God our prayers. God, we come before you having been through a week uh, that has been incredibly difficult uh, for the nation. Our hearts go out to those families who lost loved ones, whether in Dallas or in Minnesota or in Louisiana. Lord, we can debate whether uh, whether or not deaths are justified or justifiable. But for those families that have lost someone that they love, it really doesn't matter. We pray for those families. We pray for police throughout the nation may go to work today feeling particularly heightened and aware and perhaps a little anxious. Lord, we pray too for minority communities that may be feeling some of those same things just from the other side. Lord, we do pray for reconciliation between people. We pray that the nation might continue to work on its history and its legacy of race. We've come a long way and we still have much longer to go. And we know that these conversations and this work has to be renewed in every generation. That it's not to be taken for granted. So we pray for an end to violence. We pray that together we might embrace paths of peace. We pray that together we might find solutions that help to save lives, prevent one more family from receiving that knock on their door that they are dreading. We pray today for our political process that as the party conventions take place, that we might come to an understanding of how we need each other. That the campaigns might be contests of ideas rather than attacks on character. Let me pray for your wisdom. We know that our nation is not the only place that experiences violence. And so we look around the world and we realize that there are 
so many other nations dealing with so much upheaval and turmoil and political violence, religious violence. We pray for all the nations of the Middle East. We pray for Christian brothers and sisters throughout the Middle East today. And Muslims who resist ISIS and those like them. Lord, we pray for peace, for courage, for strength. We lift these concerns that have been raised before us today and prayers for forgiveness, for reconciliation, prayers for healing. We know that there are many, many prayers that we could offer together for many people in our lives. Lord, we pray for those who are still mourning the loss of people that they love very dearly. We pray for a young man today, Cole, who's undergoing treatment as we speak. We pray for his protection and for his healing. Lord, for this congregation that you might continue to walk with us guide us through this next phase of our uh, construction project. More than that, give us a vision for how we can be in service to this community. How we can offer our lives, our gifts, our work for those around us. That we might see transformation and change. Lord, we are grateful for this nation that we live in, and we pray that together we might come to an understanding of us as one people. One people. Lord, we're grateful for all that you've done. We pray that you continue to be at work around us. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
one shall never his covenant remove. His name shall stand forever. That name to us is love. Now I'll remind you to come upstairs and uh, join us for some cake. Otherwise, we'll have to eat it all ourselves, and that would be a tragedy. So we invite you to come and join us upstairs. As you go forth from this place, go forth to be healers, to be peacemakers. Go forth knowing that Christ goes with you, the Holy Spirit surrounds you. Go forth to be led in the spirit of the Lord who has called you. Go forth in his name. Amen.